Hello everybody and welcome to the LSE for this online event, Life in a Post-Covid World, Learning from Southeast Asia. This event, event is part of this year's LSE Festival, Shaping the Post-Covid World, which is a week of free events on the direction the world could and should take after the Covid crisis and how social science research can help shape that world. My name's Catherine Allerton, I'm an Associate Professor of Anthropology at the LSE. And for the event today, we're inviting four leading thinkers on Southeast Asia to reflect on the lessons of COVID-19 for the region. In particular, we've asked our speakers today to reflect on two key questions. What does the pandemic reveal about the region that we might not have known before? And what are the likely future social, political or other impacts of the pandemic on Southeast Asia? We would like to dedicate this event to the memory of Professor Saw Sui Hock, whose generosity led to the founding of the LSE Southeast Asia Centre and who sadly passed away last month at the age of 89. Please do visit the Southeast Asia Centre website to read our tribute to Professor Saw's academic and philanthropic work. And we also encourage you to look at the Southeast Asia blog um, where we've been posting a series of articles from academics and practi practitioners from the region regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Southeast Asia. Now let me briefly introduce you to each of our speakers. Professor Hyun Ban Shing is Professor of Geography and Urban Studies at the LSE and directs the LSE Saw Sui Hock Southeast Asia Center. Dr. Nicole Carato is an Associate Professor at the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra. Dr. Sinyi Ko is Senior Lecturer in Global Studies at Monash University, Malaysia. And Professor John Sidel is the Sir Patrick Gillam Professor of International and Comparative Politics at the LSE. The format of this event is as follows. Each speaker is going to be given five to seven minutes for their initial reflections on COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. And we will then have a more general discussion based on questions submitted by the audience. So please do use the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions to the panel members. And please do let us know your name and your affiliation. So without further ado, let me hand over to our first speaker, Professor Hyun Bang Shin. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Uh, and it's great to be part of this uh, panel and, and to be also uh, be uh, uh, enjoying uh, uh, engaging with this debate on COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. As the director of the Socio Southeast Asia Center, I would also like to say just once more that Professor So was a prominent academic and philanthropist whose generosity founded the center and that Professor So will be fondly remembered there will be a series of programs to remember Professor Saw at the school level. So please watch out for the news on the center's website. As for the today's event, by way of starting my intervention, I'd like to start with SARS pandemic, uh, which I guess some of you may remember, uh, which happened in the early 2000s. In geography and urban studies, uh, Harris Alley and Roger Kine, um, based in Canada, produced a paper in 2006, surveying the 2002-2004 SARS outbreak and concluding that while the greater, faster and more spatially complex connectivity of the globe city network should be recognized as posing new risks for the transmission of emerging infectious diseases and new challenges for their containment, their study of infectious disease also presented a fruitful, and here I quote their work, uh, work new entry point for the already lively debate on connectedness in the global city universe, end of quote. One example is this greater focus on the extensive diaspora network that spans across continents and countries. And in that regard, the pandemic has amplified the notion of global connectedness, where more than SARS was uh, able to demonstrate uh, uh, in the early 2000s. So um, here I'm referring to the current COVID pandemic Whereas the SARS pandemic in 2003 was known to be present in 29 territories and infected uh, just about 8,000 people with seven or a little less than 800 deaths, the current COVID pandemic has been basically in a truly global in scale. The majority of the cases uh, during the, pan uh, the SARS pandemic were in mainland China and Hong Kong, 
while Taiwan, Canada, and Singapore were among the top five. But now the COVID pandemic itself is, uh, it can be seen in almost every corner of the, uh, uh, of the planet. Uh, in a widely read uh, uh, intervention that appeared in the Financial Times on 3rd of April 2020, the Indian writer and activist Arundhati Roy calls for seeing the pandemic as a portal or a, a gateway between one world and the next. According to Arundhati Roy, um, COVID-19 is an opportunity to rethink the world as it is and to ready ourselves to step into a new one without dragging the, uh, the, uh, the kind of remnant of our prejudice and, and hatred or the other and uh, the contradictions that we, uh, we currently face. In thinking about the pandemic as a portal or gateway, we are, uh, uh, we are here also trying to adopt and this uh, I'm trying to refer to the work that is ongoing at the Southeast Asia Center. Uh, we are trying to adopt the methodology of critical Asian scholar uh, Chong Kwan Singh was pointing out in his book, Asia as Method. Uh, which provides a new way of using Asia as a way to generate new debate on our uh, conventional understandings of society and geopolitics, which have been influenced by the colonial politics and the global hegemony of the West. And with, with these in mind, uh, the Southeast Asia Center um, has been bringing together several dozens of scholars in 2020 since the pandemic outbreak uh, to invite them and con uh, uh, to contribute uh, to the uh, ongoing Southeast Asia blog. So we have about 40 interventions and, and the intervention number increasing um, to think about uh, what the, uh, the pandemic means to the region and also to encourage the researchers working in and on Southeast Asia make, uh, uh, make their own contributions to the uh, global knowledge production. And here we also, uh, 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 have been welcoming such inter interventions largely because we see the absence of such voices coming from the region itself. And you also be able to find out a bit more about uh, such interventions, uh, not only on the blog, but also in the forthcoming in the publication from LSE Press. And my intervention today is to some extent uh, um, uh, based on the introduction to the book itself, and also uh, based on uh, uh, the substantial contributions coming from our center researchers, Dr. Murray McKenzie and Dr. Do Young Oh. So let me kind of you know, summarize the four, uh, in, uh, four points you know, for my intervention today. First, given their invisibility and uncertainty, risks acquire their social existence only through the knowledge that is available about them and thus are dependent on the social construction of such knowledge. So during the pandemic, Governments across the world and also especially in Southeast Asia have been endeavoring to produce sophistica sophisticated sets of data that can be publicly made available as a pandemic dashboard. So you get to see a lot of these websites and the government announcements that come together with a, a large uh, set of data digested into some, uh, some uh, summary uh, numbers uh, in a very graphical format, which is uh, which is a practice that is to demonstrate the government's ability to govern their countries. Whether or not such pandemic uh, dashboards uh, reflect the true capacity to govern is a separate matter. So the ability to govern and the government uh, accountability to their population is only with respect to their own citizens. And when the governing capacity is being subject to questions, for example, by the surge of new cases, this is often associated with non-citizens, such as le uh, legal or illegal migrant workers, as has been the case in Singapore or Malaysia. Second point, what is also evident in the use of such pandemic dashboard is the neglect of other forms of public health knowledge, such as the field of experience of the societal implications of containment measures, including worsening domestic violence and mental health, and of the nuances of spatially uneven and unjust outcomes that are not easily conveyed in summary statistics or graphical forms. The third point, risks are unevenly distributed in ways that might amplify existing inequalities or complicate them as evident at all scales from the interpersonal to the global. The familiar catchphrase we get to hear during the pandemic, such as we are all in this together, 
only reveals partial truth. What I mean is while everyone is part of human race that is susceptible to the virus, not everyone is exposed to the risk to the same degree and has access to protection to the same extent. This inequity gets amplified and compounded across geographies. For example, the residents of Jakarta's informal settlements who are among the regions most vulnerable to the risks of environmental pollution, flooding, and land subsidence. They are also further exposed to the pandemic risks and are also among more likely, uh, among those populations that are more likely to lack the information and resources that are needed to recognize and avoid the pandemic risk to which they are exposed to. As critical geographer David Harvey was arguing at the start of the pandemic last year, the rhetoric of we are all in this together is no more than a rhetorical cloak over outcomes that are highly differentiated by class, gender, race, and other intersecting factors of oppression, largely originating in the dual burdens of exposure to the virus and to the job losses that are disproportionately uh, uh, borne by the new working class of the tertiary uh, service sector. The fourth and last point um, is that we also see a rich network of community organizations and civil society organizations in the region of Southeast Asia, which work together to provide mutual support for the provision of uh, adequate food for those in need and helping the vulnerable sections of their populations. This is a promising in thinking about the future and rethinking the governing capacity of the government. If you have to think of the pandemic as a gateway to somewhere and another future, what kind of destinations would they be? And this is one question I try to um, address as a, way of, as a way of concluding my intervention today. So two points here. First, the part that seizes the opportunity to construct a protected global community against the risk, which understands the intersectionality of social, economic, and political risks. Among the possibilities social scientists have raised is that, COVID-19 might serve as catalyst for a change to global developmental paradigms or a call for more caring and inclusive approaches in urban planning and design. I suppose we can go back to the case of Singapore where migrant dormitories as well as migrant workers uh, compounds elsewhere in, this re in the region are to be more incorporated into uh, the national society rather than being uh, the, the venue for segregation and trans transient uh, migrant workers. But there's also another possible track, which is a little more bleak, that is a potential to see the emergence of anxious solidarities of negative social change that can be more appealing among those that have access to resources and power. Here, the negativity is, the sen is in the sense that their foremost concern is not with need of uh, or want, uh, to bring about more protected uh, society for the, for the whole populations, but with the demand to be uh, spared from exposure to the manifold potential dangers we have collectively produced. One example would be uh, to generation more barriers or qualifications to travel in the short to medium term, or perhaps on a longer term, either in the form of vaccine passports or COVID-free fast tracks in the mobility corridor or segregation uh, in the forms of COVID-free spaces, which are reserved for the more privileged uh, populations. Another example might be the repetition of the so-called the construction of hygienic urban space, urban space by means of implementing the eradication of so-called slums and shanty towns that are home to many low-income families, which is an effort that has proven to be inadequate and limiting in the previous century. Which of the two destinations are to be reached uh, would depend very much on how the local populations are going to exert their pressure on their own government. Thus the balance of power between the society and the state on the one hand, and how much each economy is going to fare in the rapidly changing dynamics of the geopolitical economy will be ever more important. So I, I end here uh, with that remark. Thank you very much. And I hand over to the next speaker. Thank you, Hyun. And our next speaker is Dr. Nicole Carato. Nicole. Yes, good afternoon to everybody. And thank you to the organizers of the LSE Festival for spotlighting Southeast Asia as an area of interest when we examine lessons and legacies of COVID-19. And my contribution to this conversation is to say that COVID-19 brought into sharp focus the importance of everyday politics 
the seemingly mundane but nevertheless meaningful performances of citizen voice and accountability, as well as how state neglect and oppression at a time of uncertainty is felt in everyday life. And Southeast Asia, I argue, is a rich context to elucidate this observation, given that these performances of everyday politics take place against the backdrop of increasingly illiberal states. So what do I mean by this? So I'm an ethnographer like you, Catherine, specializing on the Philippines. Um, for the past few years, my intellectual project examines how democratic politics can take root in communities suffering from misery, trauma, and devastation. And my field sites include communities working hard to overcome the adversities they face in the aftermath of disasters, armed conflict, and police brutality. So I document cases of micropolitical acts of participation. So for example, I've witnessed survivors of the world's strongest storm come together in a mass grave and lay a wreath with the inscription that says justice. So this act is loaded with meaning. It politicizes a space of grief um, to demand accountability from the state for unavoidable deaths. I spent time with mothers of men who were killed in the violent operations as part of the Duterte regime's drug war. And these women actively make sense of their collective trauma in church-based activities and exchange information on how they can claim state support uh, in online chat groups and everyday conversations. I have many more examples. I can talk about this all day. But when I talk about these examples, I often get asked the question, what's the big deal? Why do I bother documenting the seemingly mundane lived experiences of people asserting their voice and demanding accountability in the backdrop of an unresponsive and repressive state. And I think COVID-19 um, brings into sharp focus why micropolitics matters, why we need to turn our attention to the politics of everyday life. Because the pandemic has shown us that our homes, our immediate communities, and seemingly apolitical spaces are critical sites where our democratic rights are either protected or compromised. During the pandemic, our homes have become both a place of refuge and a place of suffering. And I'm sure all of us here have experiences speaking to this reality of our home serving as place of refuge and place of suffering. Um, but this observation has been the case in communities uh, long before the pandemic. So in the Philippines, for example, the home is the ground zero of President Duterte's violent drug war. In the Philippines, the home is a space of political judgment. For some, it is a safe space when the police place a sticker on the door and declare the house to be drug-free. But for others, the home is a space of danger. It's a space of execution once cops decide to use their extrajudicial and unaccountable power, when cops force their entry in people's homes and shoot suspected drug dealers in front of their families. And the home as a site of judgment continues during the pandemic. The home can be a site of compliance where obedient citizens stay so as not to harm others. But in practice, um, the home as a site of compliance is an impossible project for pandemic response. The home for 2 million Filipinos cannot be the site of social distancing because the home is a box where eight people live. Staying at home cannot facilitate regular hand washing for regular hand washing is such a great effort when there's no running water. The logic of going to the market once a week to stockpile food, uh, to stockpile food at home is such an out of touch middle-class logic imposed on daily wage earners who don't even own a refrigerator. So obviously this is not unique to the Philippines. We can see these experiences um, throughout the region that the home is a site of judgment. Um, meanwhile, the space outside the home can be described as a space of defiance. It is the site where people render their demands visible. It is a site to protect state neglect and demand support from government. But in the Philippines, this is also the site when the president's shoot to kill orders to quarantine violators is enforced. And this experience is resonant across the region, the space outside the home as a site of defiance. We see this as young people in Thailand and Myanmar mobilized to demand political reforms that will outlast the pandemic. Finally, the pandemic invites us to deepen our appreciation of the home and how our understanding of the home is constitutive of political decision making. And here um, I echo the observation and think about how Singapore's success story of pandemic management crumbled 
as the virus reached the dormitories of low-wage foreign workers. 90% of Singapore's COVID-19 cases were from migrant dormitories, intimate spaces that in the beginning were excluded from the imaginary of the nation that needs protection from a global health emergency. And LSE's COVID-19 and Southeast Asia blog spotlighted this issue several times with authors underscoring the need to reform the way in which Singapore pathologizes migrant spaces as areas of this amenity and react by segregating foreign workers further to the periphery, justified based on an implicit socio-immunological, that's a hard word, socio-immunological principle. And I'm citing William Jamison's piece in the Southeast Asia blog here. So in conclusion, where does this take us? I think the pandemic is an invitation for observers of the region to take a closer and more serious look at the intimate sphere as a site of both state control as well as a site for future making driven by ordinary citizens. And obviously time is not on my side, but I wish to flag that despite the worrying examples I put forward today, there are also practical instantiations of democratic innovations in everyday life that are worth celebrating. And I hope we can draw attention to these innovations in our discussion later. So I'll end my comments there. Thank you, Nicole. And now let me turn over to Dr. Sin Yi Ko. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you to the LSE events as well as the Southeast Asia Center for organizing this panel. Um, now, my contributions will have lots of resonance to the points that have been raised by John as well as Nicole. Um, so I want to talk about three points. The first point is that the pandemic has drawn attention to the discriminatory and unequal treatment of essential workers, most of whom are migrant workers. And these kinds of discriminatory and unequal treatments have always been there. But it is during the pandemic that we see this continue, continually being practiced by default to a large extent. So we see this happening in countries in the region, such as Singapore and Malaysia, that were applauded for their handling of the pandemic in the earlier phases, but saw subsequent outbreaks involving mainly migrant workers. And these are some practices that we've seen, for example, keeping migrant workers in cramped dormitories where social distancing is not possible, rounding up undocumented migrants and putting them into detention centers, imposing lockdowns and travel bans in areas where migrant worker communities live, and even turning away asylum seekers and deporting undocumented migrants who are arguably the essential workers. So all of these discriminatory practices suggests that migrant workers are not being accepted as equal contributing members of the society and the workforce, even when we know very well that they are needed and in fact essential for national as well as regional economies. And here when I talk about acceptance, I'm not talking just about acknowledging their existence in the society, but I'm talking more specifically about social legal acceptance. So accepting their legal status and according to them, uh, legal status and protection. So during the pandemic, it is this rapid spread of the virus amongst migrant worker groups and in dormitories that call our attention to this group who are otherwise invisibilized or taken for granted as well as their living and work conditions. The pandemic reminds us that the very groups who are typically othered, marginalized or kept away turn out to be the essential workers who constitute our economic and supply chain systems, if you want to think from that perspective, and who make our collective sustenance possible. So my second point is that the pandemic has shown us that keeping migrants marginalized during the pandemic, during a time of crisis, actually hurts the collective society as a whole. So we now come to know that protection is only as good as the weakest link. As long as there are some groups who are not accorded the same level of care and protection, societies and the world as a whole will not be immune to the virus. And more specifically, as long as there are groups who are not included in public health coverage and protection, whether this is before the pandemic or during the pandemic, then no one is really protected. So in the case of migrant workers, the temporariness and precarity that are accorded to them, especially in pre-pandemic times, contribute to the vulnerabilities that they face during the pandemic, which makes them less resilient 
and by extension, makes us less resilient as a society. We also come to see that migrant workers' economic sustenance may be highly dependent on mobility, whether these are international, regional, or even local mobilities. And in lockdown situations where mobility is suspended or not possible, then their livelihoods disappear. So we have seen that the marginalization of certain groups during the pre-pandemic times has actually translated directly into compromises in pandemic preparedness. In countries in Southeast Asia, where there's a general lack of universal health care, this makes the groups who are already marginalized become even more vulnerable to the virus. For migrant workers who lack documented status, this is compounded by their fear and distrust of authorities, which doesn't appear out of nowhere. Um, and this fear and lack of documented status keeps some of the groups in the shadows when visibility is needed to combat the spread of the virus through things like contact tracing and even in distribution of assistance. So overall, the lack of formal integration of these groups into the society presents challenges during this time of crisis in terms of reaching out to these communities and giving them the kind of assistance and protection that they need. So my third and last point is about looking towards the future. The pandemic has highlighted some key questions about inclusion and exclusion. Questions about who is being protected, who is being blamed and disregarded and why. And this applies to both the time before the pandemic as well as during the pandemic. And even more important, as we look towards the future um, after the pandemic. So other questions include who is given leeway to move and be mobile and whose mobilities are subjected to surveillance and policing and why. So in my recent blog post for the LSC Southeast Asia blog, I've suggested that a new hierarchy of mobility deservingness may rise following the COVID-19 pandemic. And by this, I mean new or mutated criteria for assessing an individual's deservingness to move, whether this is across international borders, internal borders, or any kind of borders. We have also seen the development of digital health passports, COVID-19 free health certificates that are now becoming additional mandatory travel documentation. So the key question then is this, when health becomes a key criteria for mobility and migration, what does this tell us about our existing social welfare infrastructures that create health inequities in the very first place? So to end, I want to emphasize again that this pandemic is a watershed moment that reminds us very clearly that we are all interconnected. So clear segregation and inclusion and exclusion is really not the way forward. And uh, to echo what Hyun has said earlier, this is a portal for us to reimagine the future, to focus on building equitable systems of protection, including social, legal, human rights, health protection. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sinyi. And our final speaker before we um, move to question and answers is Professor John Sedell. John. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I found it very difficult as a longtime observer and analyst of politics in Southeast Asia, very difficult to, uh, to really understand how the pandemic has been unfolding uh, objectively, as it were, um, and how it's been experienced uh, subjectively. Uh, across Southeast Asia over the past year from the uh, comfort and safety of my study here at home in North London. Um, I, I fully agree uh, and, and would echo the comments and astute observations of the preceding speakers in terms of what the pandemic has revealed in terms of the entrenched forms of stratification and segregation that we see across Southeast Asia economically, in terms of health, uh, spatially, and, and also politically, and, and also in, in terms of the enduring forms of inequality and injustice, uh, exclusion and oppression that we can see uh, across the region in different forms. But I think for me, perhaps in terms of what I feel confident uh, saying I, I find revealed 
by the, uh, the pandemic uh, so far. I think it's easier and perhaps more useful for me to confine my analysis to the realm of the, the counterfactual, what, what hasn't happened, but would have, could have, perhaps should have happened on the one hand, and then the comparative uh, in terms of other analogous periods of crisis, uh, if not necessarily narrowly health crisis uh, in recent uh, or at least modern Southeast Asian history. So on the first point, I think it is worth noting something significant that hasn't happened. Although the pandemic began in China and although Southeast Asia uh, is arguably the region of the world most intimately, intensively uh, and extensively linked to China in terms of not only trade and investment uh, and flows of commodities, uh, but also human contact and travel uh, especially over the past uh, 20 uh, years. Southeast Asia, it appears, has not been especially hard hit um, by the pandemic relative to other parts of the world, including uh, the UK. Uh, and the pandemic has not revealed, in fact, any special dangers or drawbacks of tightening integration into a China-dominated regional economy. And indeed, with the rollout of Chinese-produced vaccine programs across Southeast Asia, China may prove to be the savior of the region, or at least its public health uh, savior. And we might predict accelerated economic integration over the years ahead. So instead of the pandemic revealing or reinforcing awareness of the dangers of China, you know, the fears associated uh, with the rise of China that are, are uh, these days being echoed and amplified, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, here in London and elsewhere, I think the opposite uh, might be the case, um, at least from, from what I can observe from afar. Um, on, on this first point of the kind of woulda, coulda, shoulda of the, uh, the pandemic, uh, I also think it, it may be the case that another non-event is worthy of consideration, namely mobilization from below uh, and or reform from above focused on public health. Over the past two decades, one of the, uh, the, the most positive developments across the region has been uh, the expansion of public health care programs in a number of countries in Southeast Asia, but with more on paper than we see uh, in practice and with considerable problems uh, and limitations uh, in reality as opposed to what has been promised. And so what does not appear to have emerged is a kind of tectonic shift or sea change in popular attitudes and policy approaches to public health, at least not yet. And, and I really hope that uh, this will be the case if it isn't already kind of bubbling up at a level that is not observable from afar by, by people uh, at such a, a remove as myself. But on the second point, uh, in terms of comparison, if we look back over the past 100 years of Southeast Asian uh, history, what is so striking to me at least uh, is uh, how little uh, analogous periods of crisis, most obviously economic crisis, really prove to be transformative in macro political terms, at least if we exclude World War II as an obvious protracted period of crisis. Uh, so if we go back to the depression in the 1930s, very little actually happened at the macro political level across the region. And there was very little obvious lasting impact. It was a pretty boring decade in most of Southeast Asia, most famously in uh, the Netherlands, East Indies, today's Indonesia. Obviously something important happened in Thailand in 1932, uh, but I don't think we can attribute that to, to the depression. Uh, there were quite a few interesting years in the late 1930s in what was then uh, British colonial Burma. But again, I don't think that we should attribute that to the depression. Otherwise, it was kind of a, uh, a pretty dull decade historically, um, despite the best efforts of historians to excavate and, and emphasize the, uh, the developments and trends of those years. I think likewise, we could look at the, the world recession that's often forgotten of the early 1980s. Uh, and, and we could note the, the various forms of economic adjustment and their, their impact across Southeast Asia. Um, but there, I would say the, the only country which, which really was impacted by that politically in, in an obvious way was the Philippines. And perhaps more notably, what we often refer to as the Asian financial crisis of 1997, 1998, which was also, if you lived in Indonesia, as I did at the time, a health crisis um, for, for people. 
Um, I, I think, again, you would struggle to make a, a, a convincing argument that it was a, a politically significant watershed moment for the region. Uh, you, you might cite Indonesia uh, and, and suggest wrongly in my view that it was the financial crisis that led to the overthrow of Suharto. You might note the, the medium term impact on politics in Thailand, but otherwise I think you'd be hard pressed to suggest that there were lasting political consequences of that financial crisis. And the same would be true of the, the so-called credit crunch, the global financial crisis uh, that erupted in 2008. Uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to identify that as another watershed moment. So for better and certainly for worse, um, uh, Southeast Asian people and Southeast Asian governments uh, are resilient and resourceful uh, and very adaptive and also very ahead of the curve in terms of 21st century technology. Uh, and I think that um, if we're going to look for sources of political change, uh, we, we should look at the, uh, the, the developments and trends within these countries and the capacities of people and governments within them, unequally distributed capacities, no doubt, unfairly distributed capacities, to uh, innovate and adapt and mobilize uh, and suppress and counter mobilize um, uh, without assuming that this will be a watershed moment for Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I look forward to the, the research that will be coming out uh, in months and years to come to investigate the more subtle and significant uh, lived experiences, everyday politics and and lasting consequences of the crisis. But at this point from you know, the, the remove where I'm sitting for better and for worse, uh, that's what I see. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you to all of our um, panelists for your um, opening comments. We're now going to open the floor to questions from the audience. We've already got some questions coming through. Please do type short questions into the Q&A box and we'll try and answer as many as we can. So I'm going to start with a question which I think I'd like to address to John. It's coming from Ariadne Schultz in Durham and she's interested in the intersection of the pandemic with kind of everyday politics on the streets and the actions of kind of protest by citizens noting how in the US you know particular protests um, led to sharp rises in cases and fatalities she's concerned about what might be happening in Myanmar in terms of protests and then the link to um, increasing cases I don't know if you can say anything John about you know that kind of the intersection of pandemics of the pandemic and politics and the kind of impact on the average citizen. Yeah, I, I, I probably can't say um, much of great interest uh, or anything well informed. And in terms of everyday politics, you'd be better better off hearing from uh, Nicole Corto. Um, but you know, I, I think the the protests that we've seen in Bangkok uh, and now in various cities in Myanmar are testimony to the the courage of Southeast Asians fighting for political change and 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 yet they're doing so in ways that I, I'm confident they would have done without the pandemic. Um, it will be very sad and tragic if in fact these uh, these protests do lead to um, you know further deaths and, and a rise in transmission of, uh, of COVID-19. But I think if we look back at the uh, Black Lives Matter protests across the United States and elsewhere uh, that unfolded months ago, I, I don't think there's, uh, there's been any evidence that they, uh, they led to uh, individual or, or a, a sort of macro rise in, in, in deaths and fatalities or, or even in the transmission of the disease. So I hope that won't be the case. Uh, but again, I would say these are protests that, that had to happen. Um, regardless of the pandemic. And, and they happened according to a timetable that hasn't been, hasn't been driven by the, the, the pandemic. Thanks, John. Um, Nicole, I have another question for you. I mean, you can speak to that last question if you'd like to. Um, and your question is coming from Satwinda Rehal from the University of the Philippines, um, Open University in Manila, um, who's asking about the kind of rise of um, cases of gender violence and domestic violence and particular health inequalities 
to do with the provision of reproductive health services um, and the kind of impacts on and adolescents and vulnerable women um, at the moment, the ways in which the pandemic might have reduced access to those services and therefore might be increasing uh, the kind of reproductive injustices faced by vulnerable women in the Philippines. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that issue or the way forward. I certainly have no ideas on the way forward. I would have an idea on how to answer this question if we can use the human rights framework of reproductive health as a human right of every single Filipino. But the problem is we are operating with a regime that has little regard for human rights. So I'm not sure what applicable framework we can use in this context. What I can say though, and I think this kind of dovetails to the other question about changing norms when it comes to gender, is that when we look at Southeast Asia, I think we also have to start looking at women as agents. And here I'm talking about how this region has provided a steady supply of feminized labor when it comes to global healthcare. So we're talking about the Philippines, we're talking about Indonesia, and increasingly we are seeing how these women, especially in the NHS, are trying to make um, clearer demands when it comes to protection of frontline health workers who are also um, ethnic minorities. So this doesn't directly answer uh, Rihal's question, but I think it kind of gestures towards another way of looking at women, their reproductive rights, uh, instead of seeing them as victims, maybe we can start seeing them as active agents who are also at the forefront of demanding state accountability and, and attention um, in this context. Thank you, Nicole. And we have a question for Sin Yi um, from Avni Patam, who's an undergraduate student at the University of Virginia. Um, who says that, you know, uh, you mentioned in your talk the need to include marginalized migrant workers um, and, and their kind of economic and social supply chains in thinking about public health. Um, and you referred to universal healthcare provision, but they're wondering how you thought welfare programs um, through employment might be impacted in the future. Assuming universal healthcare is a step that governments aren't ready to take, um, what might be the role for strengthening labor rights or bargaining power um, to allow provision of healthcare and welfare entitlements to particular migrant workers? Thank you for the question, Navni. Um, so I was talking about universal healthcare as example, an example of what perhaps governments can do, uh, not just to uh, acknowledge the existence of migrant workers or even labor labors, um, but to accord to them the kinds of protection that they need. Um, so you can think about this in interconnected terms. It's not just specific to health or public health provision, but what you talk about in terms of uh, economic rights and labor rights, those are equally important. And the other speakers have raised this point talking about the rise of agency, a bottom up rise of agency of certain groups who are demanding for their rights uh, as a result of the pandemic. And this could very well be uh, many, many steps preliminary steps towards the final goal, we hope, which is for more universal coverage and protection of rights for everyone. Thanks, Sinyi. Um, now we have a question which I think we could address to um, all panel members. It's coming from David Walter, who is an alumni of um, Birkbeck, and he is interested in your thoughts on how the pandemic might challenge particular traditional values in the region, perhaps particular values uh, about women's roles, about uh, Southeast Asia's position in the world or um, the kind of international position of Southeast Asia, but also religious ideas, whether these are to do with Buddhist or Confucian or other ideas and practices. I don't know if any of our panelists have thoughts on, you know, how that, it might be too soon to tell, but do you have any predictions about how the pandemic might challenge or not particular traditional values in Southeast Asia. Hyun, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, uh, I guess, and uh, Catherine, you might have a, a bit more to say on uh, given your work on uh, in the region, but um, I guess what, or here for now, briefly, I, all I can say is, I think there may be a little a bit of too much emphasis on you know, looking at traditional values and you know, or associating these with Confucianism or Buddhism or etc. Uh, and I think this, there's a bit of myths uh, still prevailing in the public media or in public discourse. And and 
what I want to emphasize is you know, to some extent, yes, I mean, there are these, some of these traditional values such as uh, more imp giving more importance to uh, the role of families and uh, uh, the, the uh, filial piety and so on and so forth being an open discussed. And I guess th there is some in a, 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 um, a reality in that kind of in a, uh, emphasis. But at the same time, many of these values are being reshaped and reconfigured uh, and reflecting the modern society, the way the society itself is being structured, how the economy operates and so on. So these are, I think, more recreating and reproducing uh, more selectively what has been previously discussed in the, in the history of each society uh, to be put together, uh, in, uh, to be made you know, adaptable and, and reused in, in the current economy. So just looking at one of other questions about welfare in here, I guess uh, this is also one, one interesting thing about how the welfare can be introduced in, in our discussion about the role of families. And then very often Asian families are used, known to be uh, supporting each other um, as part of, kind of the, uh, continue, continuing with the extension of the traditional values in the, in, in the modern era. But I think it, it's also important to say um, these Asian economies in the, in the times of rapid economic development, even if you look at countries like Singapore and Taiwan and South Korea uh, and so on, they have been very much dependent on these families you know, uh, providing mutual support while the state provision, provision of welfare has been very much absent. So unlike the Western democratic kind of arrangement in the post you know, war you know, consensus after the Second World War, uh, I think the Asian economies were largely using the uh, individual you know, contributions and family support, the support coming from the extended members of family network being the major source of welfare provision while the state itself has been very much in you know, directing the resource to some other selective use, uh, such as industrialization, or some resources being uh, taken away, siphoned off you know, by the coalition between state bureaucrats and uh, elite and the economic elite. So I think this is something very important. And in that regard, the Asian values, as, et cetera, being kind of emphasized in a, a more than what they should have been. So I guess I, the same thing will happen in a, during the pandemic as well. And, but I think I'll stop there and hand over to other speakers. Thanks, Yun. Nicole, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, I'm also not a fan of a discussion of Asian values because it feels a bit essentialist, but I can affirm though the impression that the pandemic reinforces governance logics. So for example, if we talk about the case of the Philippines and how patronage is used as a governance logic, that's still very much alive now. So distribution of aid is associated to loyalty to the president. Um, there have been accusations of rich families smuggling coronavirus vaccines in the country. So in a way, the logic of patronage still very much exists and kind of shapes pandemic response in a country that has been known to be an anti-developmental state compared to other countries in the region. But that's not to say there are no innovations. So one example I'd like to spotlight here is the mayor of Pasig City who considered LGBT families as a proper recipient, as a legitimate recipient of COVID-19 aid. Um, this may not sound like a big deal for audiences in different countries, but for a hyper-Catholic Philippines, this is a big deal. And this is something that can create a normalization of alternative family arrangements. So I think um, it's both, the, the pandemic is both reinforcing, but also creating spaces for new ways of how we can imagine governance logics uh, in different countries in the region. Thank you, Nicole. I'm going to move on to, we have a couple more questions coming through. We have a really interesting question from Tomo Usuda, who is in Vietnam, who is interested in hearing speakers' opinions about why we don't very often discuss um, the success of Vietnam in managing COVID um, and its particular policies regarding COVID. And is this because of a kind, the, the country is a, is a, you know, has a single party government and is it to do with a kind of fear of the particular politics of Vietnam. There's also a question from Lawrence G um, asking a, a similar kind of uh, on a similar theme, which is that, you know, the sort of successes in uh, managing COVID-19 in Southeast Asia, uh, it's often the most successful governments are those with more authoritarian authoritative um, governance and particular compliance of the population. Um, I don't know if John, you have any thoughts on this kind of issue of like authoritarian governments and successful policies? Well, uh, we obviously have 
you know, lots of counterexamples around the world in, in terms of pandemic policies and as with, you know, economic policies that authoritarian governments are not always, you know, uh, all knowing, all effective, um, you know, uh, governments in terms of their policies and responses to crises. I think in the case uh, of the pandemic, um, as Hyun uh, rightly noted, uh, for countries like Vietnam and countries outside the region like Taiwan and South Korea, the experience of SARS some years ago was one that, that really did spur to action some kind of response that, that has had lasting significance in terms of public health care and policy sort of readiness. Um, so I, I, I think uh, it, it may well be that it, it's a, a lasting effect of, of the preceding experience of SARS rather than any great testimony to the, uh, the supposed effectiveness of authoritarian rule. After all, if you look at Vietnamese politics, um, you know, it, it is much less monolithic uh, and, and much less seamless in terms of authoritarian rule uh, as scholars of the country tell us uh, than one might automatically uh, assume. Thanks, John. Sinyi, I wonder if you can tell us about um, how this kind of discussion plays out in Malaysia. It, you know, in the Malaysian press, is there a particular discussion of, you know, how Malaysia is sort of handling the crisis compared to other neighboring countries, perhaps? Well, the story is not so straightforward. I mean, at different points in time, you may see that the country is doing quite well in terms of managing the pandemic, but in different times, then uh, the country is actually not doing that well. Um, so it really depends on how the pandemic pans out. And as you know, there are also internal politics and politicking happening within the government that sort of compromises the efficiency of the handling of the pandemic. So it's, it's really a lot of different factors coming in. It's not just a matter of what is the structure or style of the governance, but also uh, many other factors that are happening on the ground. Thank you, Sinyi. Um, Gavin Galloway, um, an LSE alumnus, has asked a question about whether the pandemic is likely to have any substantial impact on the evolution of political structures across the Southeast Asian region. Nicole, you spoke about very nicely about everyday politics and micro political acts, but do you want to say anything about those kind of larger political structures? So there has been a near consensus, I would say, that the entire region is experiencing a return to illiberalism or an upsurge in illiberalism practices. I prefer to use the use of authoritarian innovations in the region, meaning the use or the, the performance of practices that may seem democratic on the surface or justified as democratic on the surface, but are really used for authoritarian ends. And I think the pandemic has been a perfect cover to experiment on these authoritarian practices in the region. So we can talk about fake news laws, um, emergency declarations. In the case of the Philippines, it was at the height of the pandemic when the government um, had an anti-terror law, which basically curtails a lot of civil liberties. So I think one of the important uh, developments that's worth monitoring is what kinds of policies, laws, and practices that are institutionalized during the emergency period that will be, that will kind of signal a path dependency towards a stronger illiberal rule in the region. But of course, it's always nice to punctuate this with an optimistic um, approach, which is to say we also see pushback. So uh, John earlier talked about the protests happening in the region that has also happened in the Philippines. There have been dramatic images of students who are taking part in socially distanced protests um, against uh, state repression. So it's worth monitoring the tensions between the two. And I think one of the um, areas we haven't sufficiently talked about is the site of the digital, right? And this is where increasingly politics is being created um, and performed uh, during the pandemic precisely because we don't have a choice. So this is, I think, uh, one area of contestation uh, between citizens and states, especially since um, there, we have very limited options on how we can exercise politics when we are required to socially distance. Thanks, Nicole. John, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I thought you spoke really interestingly about sort of what hasn't happened during the pandemic, but are you are you feeling able to predict what might happen afterwards in relation to political structures or? Uh, 
No, no, but I, I would I would say that I think Nicole's points are, are very important and 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 are worth keeping in mind. Uh, looking looking ahead and, and also looking back at at what's now on the books in terms of you know new laws, new regulations, new practices that have been introduced and that that might might stick and stay. I think that that's an astute observation that I, I would I, I think is worth keeping in mind. Thank you, and I think we have time just for one final question um, which is from Carolyn Bollig um, and she um, and, and I might address this to Hyun um, she notes that in her research on the impact of the pandemic in um, Southeast Asia she's really keeps coming back to the issue of informality I don't know if that means the kind of informal economy in particular um, and the consequences it has for social protection in a pandemic um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, Hyun, about how you know it, the pandemic might lead countries to sort of address this issue of the sort of informal economy and how to protect workers within it. Uh, I suppose the 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 field of study you know, is also going to respond to this in a in a number of different ways in the coming months and years. So it's, it might be a little premature to say anything conclusive, but. Uh, I suppose one one immediate uh, thought will be more about going back to my earlier comment about how the countries are trying to how all these different governments are trying to you know demonstrate their ability to govern, and I think this is where uh, it, it's going to be quite interesting in the coming you know, in the months and years, and especially the government you know effort you know to um, to ensure that they know every corner of their territory, every section of their population. Um, I think this pandemic provides this kind of incentive to some extent to the government to be a little more in interventionist uh, in these places, which used to provide a very health healthy uh, kind of dynamics in terms of the social structure, the social innovation, as well as you know, um, a challenges to the existing regime itself. So I think that's going to be a, a very interesting aspect you know, to, to watch out for. Uh, well, at the same time, you know, uh, these places are also uh, proven to be very resilient. You know, and, uh, an expression I, I try not to use them much, they open, but they used, they used to, uh, you know, these spaces of you know, informality, um, uh, the informal population, so the so-called informal populations are the ones who used to also provide a very healthy response to various you know, uh, top-down measures. Um, and, and I think this is uh, going to continue to uh, 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 produce the tension between uh, what the government is trying to do and how the, the populations are going to respond to. And I think in a, well, the direction itself can be a little more bleak and a, a bit uh, uh, pessimistic, especially as the government tries to extend their arms you know, to, uh, to cover these territories. Um, uh, I, I don't think it's going to be in a, uh, always going to be in a, uh, the government way taking the uh, uh, taking the place. So the, the tension will probably continue, and it's proper uh, for us, the researchers and scholars, to actually continue to observe how this tension is going to evolve in the post-pandemic world. Thank you. That um, really resonates with what Nicole was talking about earlier in terms of the home as a place of refuge and suffering as well. You know, the informal settlement as a place of sort of suffering, but also certain kind of like resilience um, for the future. Um, I think we have almost run out of time now. I, um, I don't know if any of our speakers have any final comments that they would like to make in the last two minutes. Sinyi, do you have any partic anything particular you'd like to say at the end? No? <laughs> Nicole, anything you'd like to add? No. So I'd like to thank you all for um, your presentations today. Today, It's been great to listen to all of your comments. Thank you to those of people who've joined us um, on Zoom and on Facebook um, and for your questions for the speakers. We're glad that you could find time to be with us today. Um, please don't forget to visit the LSE Southeast Asia blog to check out the blog posts on um, uh, COVID-19 and its impact on Southeast Asia. Um, and thank you very much to everyone for coming today.